Um, so uh, uh, I guess in this session here we are, in, uh, instead of in the morning at uh, 30 or 40,000 feet with inspiration, here we are down in the trenches in the mud, uh, struggling with real, <laughs> with uh, muddy problems and uh, trying to do better. Uh, I also want to just take uh, 15 seconds to the first time I've been inside the uh, National Library of Medicine and Physical, uh, the actual building, and I am very grateful to them because uh, it was the introduction of Medline uh, that, uh, and it was brand new at UCSD in about 1992, and it was because I logged on and typed uh, green fluorescent protein as a keyword. That back then you had to do everything in text uh, search, search mode. Uh, without that, I would never have started the work that got me to Stockholm. So it's uh, that's uh, one of the little unsung uh, uh, activities that way back when made uh, an awful lot possible. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, 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 imaging in general, both at the whole body level, but at also at the uh, improvement of surgery. And, and of course, as Dr. Seltzer will agree, uh, they work together very closely. And these are the people who have been involved. I do want to make a conflict of interest disclosure that we are trying to commercialize these molecules and that's the only way to get them into the clinic, uh, but that does mean that there is a potential conflict of interest. So uh, our molecular target has been proteases in, uh, in cancer, at least uh, uh, because most cancer deaths, of course, do occur due to metastases in distant organs rather than in primary tumors, uh, and uh, <coughs> cells have to break through normal tissue either to, and then the basement membrane, either to reach the bloodstream or to the lymphatics, uh, and either one of those requires expression and activation of proteases to chew, to help the cancer cells chew their way through the normal tissue, also to release angiogenic factors and a whole complicated series of uh, biochemical steps to uh, engender the tumor microenvironment, and I don't have time to go through all of those. Uh, the cartoon I could even just steal from a commercial website. Uh, this uh, activity of proteases is sufficiently known. In fact, the website even highlighted two of our favorite uh, of the uh, 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 extracellular proteases that are involved here, and matrix metalloproteinases 2 and MMP9, just two members out of about a 25-member family uh, that mediate many forms of extracellular matrix degradation. And uh, EM Sciences makes reagents for the in vitro uh, uh, imaging of MMP2 and 9, but the in vivo imaging in a patient is one of the unsolved challenges that we're working on. So uh, the scientific strategy that we're following, at least, uh, is based on first a little bit of known biochemistry that we had no part in uh, discovering, uh, which is that uh, highly positively charged uh, peptides full of um, things like arginines and lysines, but particularly arginines, uh, those like to stick to the outside of the cell. And if you uh, attach a payload uh, that's going along for the ride, covalently attached, uh, that will likewise stick to the outside of the cell. And people believe that this is due to the electrostatic uh, attraction of the plus charges from the polycation against the negative surface charges that all cells have, some of which come from phospholipids, but even more come from proteoglycans. And then having adsorbed to the surface, then some of this stuff gets endocytosed, uh, as shown here, and then a fraction of what got endocytosed by the most mysterious step in this process manages to escape into the cytosol and nucleus. And this is much beloved of people who work in, say, tissue culture, which is where this uh, uh, mechanism has largely been confined. Uh, if you want to get impermeant payloads into cells uh, uh, and you don't want to have to microinject them individually, uh, this is a decent way uh, of doing it. Uh, so uh, uh, this is one of the great hopes, for example, of delivering siRNA uh, that uh, Phil Sharp had been discussing. Uh, it, there are some people who think you don't have to go through the endocytic pathway. They are mainly biophysicists who don't work on cells, but rather on model systems. Uh, now, the uh, uh, polycation can be a whole range of things. D-amino acids are okay. There's no stereospecificity. And the very simplest uh, type of polycation is just a row of arginines, which I like because it's very simple. And the payloads can be all sorts of things up to nanoparticles in size. Uh, now, the problem is, is that this... Uh, sounds great and does work fair, fairly well in tissue culture if you get the conditions right, uh, but it naturally caused a great deal of excitement uh, all the way, it uh, turns out, back in the early 2000s uh, with the possibility that we could do in vivo drug delivery or macromolecule delivery in a, in a live human being this way. 
uh, all sorts of things we would love to be able to get inside cells uh, and reach intracellular targets with uh, reagents that wouldn't normally cross cells. Uh, but unfortunately, this doesn't, tends not to work, and I was watched uh, on the scientific advisory board of at least one of the companies that I helped start and watched it fail uh, and un be unable to translate this into the clinic. And one of the problems is that when you first inject this stuff, say, into a mouse, a whole mouse, uh, it... Uh, sure, it goes into the cells. It goes into the cells of the tail vein into which you did the injection because this is nonspecific. And then later some ends up in the liver, probably carried by the huge amount of albumin that also is in the blood circulation that competes. And finally it gets excreted. Uh, at no point does the tumor get a sufficient uh, uh, loading of the, of the payload that you want to deliver. And if you just increase the dose hoping f to drive a small fraction or a proportion in, uh, you end up with a dead mouse. So uh, what we decided was that we needed to make this selective, and our particular strategy was rather naive, and the reason I emphasized electrostatics is that that's all you have to do. If the plus charges love to stick to negative charges on the surface of the cell, if we build in a whole bunch of negative charges, in fact, one-to-one -one with the positive charges built into the polycanine, that internally pacifies, nullifies the plus charges. They pair up probably as a hairpin and the polycation is no longer interested because it, it's found the non-stick backing paper onto which it, it already uh, attaches itself and so it has no need to go out and uh, buy into the cell. But if we come along and cut the linker that was covalently holding these two together, then the two parts can drift away from each other. The affinity isn't that high and then wherever the protease activity was that cut the linker, it's now like we had a local microinjection of the polycation, or like we ripped off the backing paper and then this stuff immediately stuck down and then does its usual thing. So we've converted a nonspecific uh, indiscriminate loading that tends to go to the wrong place into what we hope is a tumor targeted, uh, protease targeted uh, local delivery. And indeed, uh, I wouldn't be giving you this talk except that it does seem to work. And here is an example of such a peptide in which we have nine negative charges in the portion colored red, uh, nine positive charges in the portion colored blue. Uh, that's nine arginines, and they are D-amino acids. And for us, lowercase is our uh, convention for uh, D-amino acids. Then in the middle is a cleavable linker, PLG, LAG. This is L-amino acids, natural amino acids that can be be cut by MMP2 and 9, which like to cut right between the glycine and the leucine. And uh, we, this is what we inject. Now, the tumor happens to be pre-labeled with green fluorescent protein. This is something we can do in a mouse. We pre-transfect the cells with GFP before we put it in. It's a great pity no human tumor ever came green fluorescent glowing for us. They were not prepared that way. They grew spontaneously. It would be very helpful to us as researchers if more, and even as clinicians, if more human tumors were already glowing green. But sorry, that's only something you can do in a mouse. And that's the real weakness. GFP that got me the Nobel Prize is extremely powerful when you have genetic control and it can be linked to all sorts of molecular biological events in the cell but when you are not allowed to transfect it's not actually a very good chromophore and it has no special advantage and that is the case in human beings. So here this is what we can inject as into the, uh, into the vein, in this case into the mouse, and you see that it lights up the tumor in correspondence pretty well with the GFP, which is the perfect genetic perfection of this is the gold standard, this is uh, where the tumor really is, although you can see it as well by bright field. Here is a control if we put in the same uh, probe, but the only thing is, is that we flipped over the stereochemistry of the proline, the leucine, and the alanine uh, in the cleavage sequence. Now the enzyme can't recognize it because it's the wrong stereochemistry. It's unnatural amino acids. And the same molecule otherwise of the same hydrophobicity and molecular weight, when you inject that, it, it fails to light up the tumor uh, as shown here. But there is a big juicy tumor as shown by the GFP. Now, uh, we are too thick and opaque to be directly useful in a whole body sense for fluorescence. The weakness of fluorescence is that it doesn't penetrate more than maybe a millimeter or two and it even into tissue and it, even there it gets blurry and if you happen to have skin pigment or uh, a little adipose tissue, which all too many of us have, maybe more adipose than we would like, uh, it, it's even worse. So uh, we need things like MRI 
Uh, but fortunately, this is a technology that simply targets the contrast agent. So we can switch the contrast agent to being, say, a nanoparticle loaded with gadolinium chelates, gadolinium chelates being what we use to light up a region of tissue with a so-called T1-weighted MRI. And uh, it, it actually does seem to work. So here is a mouse that has a tumor uh, implanted in its armpit. Uh, and before injection, this tumor is not particularly different in grayscale here. Uh, though there's a little bit of fat that, uh, and that wasn't perfectly nulled out in the uh, fat suppression sequence, but there isn't a big difference in grayscale between the tumor and the rest of the animal. Uh, the four circles are a little tanning bed made out of four glass capillaries filled with differing concentrations of gadolinium to serve as an internal reference. Now, then, however, then we injected the animal with this nanoparticle, which has six copies on average of the, each pept of a peptide on its surface, the same peptide I've been talking about and a bunch of gadoliniums, uh, and then we w have to wait a while for the stuff to clear out of the normal tissue uh, and let the normal tissue background go down. But what's left is a tumor that is now glowing because it has successfully, uh, or the protease in there has successfully cut the green linkers and left us with these a whole bunch of these positively charged spokes uh, sticking out that uh, nail this then nanoparticle into the tumor, whereas the normal tissue gets rid of it. And once again, here we have the control, which is the same nanoparticle with D-amino acids in the linker. And uh, though there is certainly a tumor there, it does not uh, accumulate the uh, probe. And why is this important? Well, I think as many other speakers will echo or have echoed, uh, there is a tremendous value in early cancer detection. If we catch cancers late, they tend to be relatively poor in survival. If we catch them early, particularly when they're completely irresectable, uh, we have a much easier time managing it. Uh, in an imaging term, uh, they say in breast cancer, you might have had a localized lump here in a PET scan versus here it's metastasized all over the place. Unfortunately, the current uh, clinical attempts are largely focused in this domain up here uh, because this is where the patients are desperate that, and will enroll in any clinical trial because they're at their end of the life uh, and the chances that you'll mess something up when they're, uh, I'm sorry, when they're uh, essentially uh, uh, fatal cases anyway, uh, there's much less danger. And of course, this is where the money is. And what is horrible to the healthcare system about treating at this stage compared to that stage is uh, precisely what drives drug development, the pro prospect of large profits and relatively easy clinical trials. Uh, so uh, this is the way we are now, and obviously, as some other speakers have mentioned, in the long run, the nation has to do better, and we have to begin to focus a little bit more on this area, even if that isn't quite what uh, it currently is the favorite area. A particular area that we are interested in is also detecting metastatic lymph nodes, uh, partly because that's a sort of a low-hanging fruit uh, in clinical practice. Uh, we understand that uh, this is one of the more difficult decisions a surgeon has to make on the spot. How many lymph nodes do you take out? And for us, it also has the advantage of a sort of a yes or no answer. Each lymph node is either positive or negative, whereas the boundaries of the primary tumor are sometimes a little bit uh, um, uh, vague, depending on what your criteria are. Are. Uh, uh, what I showed you before were uh, primary, big fat primary tumors, and more recently in unpublished work, we've now been able to see metastatic lymph nodes that are even a fraction of a, uh, uh, certainly a, a less than a millimeter or so in size. In a mouse model, of course, this is a primary tumor in the ear, uh, which is draining, and in this case has been allowed to go to um, uh, invade this lymph node. Uh, we didn't know it at the time. We did the MRI first, and then subsequently verified it with an independent pathologist who had not been able to see the MRI, uh, and we then compared results. On the other side here, not lit up, is the uh, a normal lymph node that is not draining here. So we think we're having some promise toward finding metastatic lymph nodes by, uh, by MRI. Uh, but the uh, next advantage of uh, this sort of imaging is that the nanoparticles can actually also carry fluorescent dyes as well as the MRI, uh, gadolinium uh, reagent, and therefore uh, we can 
begin to do uh, fluorescence guided surgery. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of this uh, in what's coming up. Here is a big fat tumor visible by MRI. And then uh, that's an axial scan. Here we laid the animal on its back, opened it up, and sure enough, there's the big tumor, big fat juicy xenograft in this case. Uh, and you can see the fluorescence. My colleague, Dr. Nguyen, who is the practicing surgeon, uh, cut this out. Uh, but she didn't use white light. Uh, she only used white light, the traditional surgical mode. We sewed up the animal again uh, and put it back in the MRI, sc MRI scanner. You can see a big hole where the tumor used to be. But also, unfortunately, up in this sort of armpit region, uh, some suspicious extra white dots that we thought were a bit uh, not not quite kosher, and indeed, after we did the sac sacked the animal and did the histology, they were indeed nests of uh, cancer cells. Whereas in this case, Dr. Nguyen used the fluorescence that she could see to guide her in a very crude original apparatus, just sort of a dissecting microscope with filters, and we managed to get a much cleaner MRI. And this could be confirmed by uh, some actual survival studies where uh, without any surgery in these two different types of one a melanoma and another a breast cancer model, both syngeneic, so they had the full tumor microenvironment. If you didn't operate, the animals would be dead in two or three weeks because this is quite an aggressive, uh, both are aggressive models. Uh, with the help of white light surgery, we get the red survival curves. You can occasionally save the, 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 uh, the one animal out of a many. Uh, but with the fluorescence guided surgery, even with crude equipment, uh, we were able to uh, increase the survival uh, to a significant extent, though not, not yet perfection. And I'd like to show you a little bit of what this looks like in now somewhat more sophisticated imaging equipment. Uh, and, but this is still nothing like what, you know, people at NIBIB are really proud of and all this really heavy multimodality stuff. This is still very, very simple-minded, but I think it makes the point. Here is a tumor in the ear. Can you see where the boundaries of the tumor are? I think you might find it a little difficult. In fact, if I hadn't told you that there was a tumor, you might not know it. This is one of the classic models, but in a moment, this is the white light view that surgeons have been re resorting to for thousands of years. Now, in a moment, I'm going to switch the illumination and I stop it here. This is the fluorescence mode. We're now looking at the deep red fluorescence of the sci fi dye attached to the polyarginine motif. And it is retained in the tumor because that's where the proteases are that cut off the polyanion, the polyglutamate region. And now you can nicely see, I hope, the boundary of the tumor, right? It's actually rather hard to do surgery in this mode because you can't see anything else. You can't see your instruments. You can't see the blood vessels, the rest of the ear. So we do uh, a very dumb and simple-minded thing, which we actually, you know, the idea, I think, may have been published first by John Frangioni at Brigham and Women's, uh, which is to uh, false color this uh, uh, monochrome image in your favorite color that doesn't normally appear in, in an animal. We picked in the following case, I think, a light blue. And uh, then you superimpose it in real time on top of the white light image. And therefore, you can get to see the both to both. So the surgeon chooses with a foot pedal which view to see. Sometimes you don't want the distraction of the fluorescence, so you have the white light. Sometimes you want just fluorescence alone. And then sometimes, in this case, this is the overlay. And every time you press the foot pedal, uh, using a foot so you, you, your hands are free, uh, you get the next view. So here we can see the fluorescence uh, into the lymph nodes in the neck of the animal. It's only been shaved. It's pretty blurry because, of course, the diffusing effect of the skin. Uh, and in a moment, Dr. Nguyen will start opening up the skin. And there she has done so. And now we can see pretty clearly that this is the heavily inflamed lymph node. There may be a small amount of involvement in this wound. And these guys are clear. And the ear was out here uh, and is not visible in this particular particular view. But right now, here in real time, the surgeon knows, cut me out. And without having to resort to uh, sentinel node uh, detection, which is only telling you anatomically which node is downstream. And we, actually, in this case, from anatomy, we already know so. But it doesn't tell you whether there are metastatic cells in them or not. OK. So on. Uh, even that, uh, though it seemed to give us quite a bit of improvement, was not good enough. So in our latest attempts, what we've done is add an extra dye called Psi7 on the polyglutamate end. And that's all we've done. But now we could get fluorescence resonance energy transfer between the Psi5 and Psi7. And that's surprisingly efficient in the case when the probe is not yet cut. This is before cleavage. 
But then after we cleave it, then, of course, the two halves drift apart. And a familiar story to any of you who've ever done molecular imaging at the microscopy level, then you lose the fluorescence resonance energy transfer between the psi 5 and psi 7. It's an independent spectroscopic instantaneous measure of cleavage. And the psi 5 goes up eightfold, and the psi 7 goes down about fivefold. It's a 40 fold change in ratio. And we love ratios because ratios cancel out all sorts of imaging artifacts, including thickness of tissue, absolute concentration of dye, quality of illumination, a sensitivity of the camera, and so on. And it focuses just on the uh, biochemical activity. And so here uh, we can show you that we are even better now at looking at lymph nodes. Uh, but immediately after injection, still nothing, there isn't time for anything to have developed. The enzyme hasn't had time to work. But say two hours after injection, now even through the skin, and it's blurring with this FRET system, we can not only see the primary tumor uh, as this uh, red, which is the pseudo color for the high psi 5 to psi 7 ratio or a lot of cleavage. We can even see the lymph node through the skin, uh, surrounded by lots of other white bright dots and so on, that if you were just looking at any one intensity, they could fool you very badly. But only when you take the ratio of psi 5 to psi 7 and code that in color and do the spectral comparison, you see that the primary tumor and the lymph node are privileged. Even here, you could barely even see the primary tumor, mainly because it was in the shadow of most of the animal. The, the, the fiber optic beam uh, illumination wasn't hitting it quite right. Uh, we can confirm that the probes are responding really to MMP2 and 9. The previous control I showed you, which is changing them to, to D amino, changing the substrate to D amino acids, is really not a very incisive control because any enzyme would probably be confused by switching from L to D amino acids. But here, genetically, we have knocked out MMP2 and 9. Here is the wild type animal, even just 45 minutes after injection, there are two tumors lit up. But if we have removed, genetically knocked down two and nine together in the tumor and in the host, then the tumor does not light up. And that is telling us that effectively in these mice, the dominant biochemical activity has to be something dependent on two and nine. We've even now be been able to see metastases on top of the liver. This used to be the worst possible problem for us because the liver has this wonderful ability to take up peptides and in general cleave them because it's so full of enzymes. Uh, but uh, now uh, we can actually see the tumors on top of the liver. These are breast cancer, uh, breast metastases. And the GFP here is marking the tumors to serve as our reference, uh, our gold standard. Uh, and if you look at, say, the Psi 5 image, it doesn't really look very much like the GFP. And there's lots of blotches that I'm pointing to with a arrows that are really, really bright in the Psi 5 image and don't, are not really tumor because they don't have GFP in them as reflecting the reference standard. But when you, after you do the Psi 5 to Psi 7 ratio and cancel them out, they're bright, but they're in the wrong ratio. And the ones with the correct ratio, indeed, pretty much match with the GFP. Not perfection, but they shouldn't be absolutely perfect because GFP and Psi 5, Psi 7 have very different penetration depths. And finally, with all of that, we feel that we've raised our specificity and sensitivity, which wasn't perfect before. Uh, we had a lot of overlap when we were just doing intensity measurements between, say, ca cancer and normal. There was a statistical difference in the means, but there was a lot of individual overlap in the populations, hence the the sensitivity and specificity were not perfect. But now that we've switched to ratioing, you can get abs what seems to be absolute criteria, uh, where you can draw separation lines that cleanly distinguish the population, and at least on very preliminary, inadequate, admittedly, uh, numbers of tests, we can get 100% specificity and sensitivity. How well this will hold up when we go into people? Probably not as well, but it's a good place to start from, and it certainly made us like the chance of doing ratioing. And we've tested this type of system with many, many of these substrates, not all in the most ratiometric mode, but here I think are about 11 human tumors and six mouse tumors. And the point is that basically every tumor type we've tried has been positive. And this is one of the virtues of the system. These enzymes are so ubiquitous that unlike your typical antibody marker or so on, which will work on some fraction of tumors of one anatomical site, uh, this seems to be relatively more universal. It may be even almost too universal, but uh, uh, that's a point of discussion. 
Okay. So we think that it's worth improving surgery. And uh, because nearly all patients with solid tumors start out with surgery, so it deserves to be improved. And NIBIB is relatively unique in liking to do this. When I talk to my colleagues in cancer biology or go to cancer biology talks, uh, 98 or 99 percent of anybody who thinks that you learn something out of something new we learn about the molecular basis of cancer, it's assumed that the only way you translate it into uh, the clinic is through making a drug. All we hear about small molecules, antibodies, over and over again. Nobody thinks that surgery or radiation therapy, which are the actual mainstays of clinical cures, nobody thinks of them as intellectual enough. Uh, you know, surgeons are just dexterous, right? Uh, literally with their fingers. Uh, however, um, I would point out that if you can catch the tumor early enough to completely cut it out, the result is an immediate cure at relatively low cost compared to the lifetime of medication on the wonderful designer drugs that don't kill the cancer uh, and merely give it time to become resistant. And the one thing a tumor can never become resistant to is being literally chopped out and dropped in formaldehyde. I do not care what else it has in it, how apoptosis resistant is, how much like cancer stem cells it is, whatever. It's gone. Uh, Okay. Of course, we, that's why we really need the early detection, to catch the cancer when it's still circumscribed. And of course, if we fail in all of this and catch it too late, maybe one day we will also be able to target chemotherapy by the same technology. Now, one of the big issues that prevents us from cut, uh, doing a better job in surgery turns out, I gather, to be cutting nerves. Uh, nerves are actually the structure that is most dangerous to cut. As a naive layperson, I used to think it was blood vessels, you know, that if you cut a blood vessel, all this blood would come spurting out. But the surgeons assure me that nowadays, with cautery and all sorts of things, uh, they, they don't lose that many patients simply due to uh, loss of blood. But if you cut a nerve, it, if it grows back at all, which is far from guaranteed, it will be very slow. And in the meantime, you have uh, loss of sensation if it's a sensory nerve or paralysis or loss of motor function if it's a motor nerve. And the current techniques are not very good, and they're mostly not very visual. Uh, I had never realized that this was a problem until a clinician, point, Dr. my colleague, Dr. Nguyen, pointed this out to me. And so we said, OK, well, let's just try to find molecules that like to bind the peripheral nerve in distinction to other tissues. So we just did phage display, a very standard biochemical technique against the dissected out um, nerves versus other tissues, found peptides. And here's an example of one of the sequences in a 12 amino acid library. I do not know why NTQTLA, you, know, you can read it, why that should bind to nerve, but it does seem to when you attach fluorophores. We can inject the labeled peptide resynthesized, not made by phage anymore. And it lights up the nerve. And the contrast lasts for a couple hours. It labels both motor and sensory nerve. The nerve does not have to be physiologically active. And our probe seems to have absolutely no biological effect on the nerve. And I'd like to show you what that looks like. Here again is a mouse, the flank in this case. And there is once again a tumor in there. Can you see the boundaries? Uh, I hope you'll admit that it's fairly tough until we turn on the fluorescence. And there's the fluorescence, and now you can see the boundaries of the primary tumor. It shades off gradually because the tumor is getting thinner and thinner, but there's no doubt where it is. Uh, that's fluorescence only, and this is our favorite overlay mode. And today, we chose to make the tumor bright green. Not because it has GFP, but again, green is something that we don't normally have. So Dr. Nguyen has taken off the skin and starting to cut away, and the sciatic is being revealed here. And at this stage, anybody can see what the sciatic is. And in there, I'm going to stop it. You'll remember that this is the tumor mass. This is the sciatic. And it looks like it's just beginning to branch here. And that if you were going to try to preserve the sciatic nerve, you would carefully dissect along its margins and separate it from this big, great big glop, which is the tumor, right? Well, that turns out to be a bit wrong. Here's an even better view at a slightly later stage. You see the beautiful one branch of the sciatic. And there's the other. But in a moment, now I switch to the fluorescence of the nerve highlighting peptide. This is in today uh, in a different, this is a different wavelength. Uh, and in, this is just fluorescence at this level. But there's the nerve you, you see. But the nerve has been diverted from its normal anatomical course by the growth of the tumor. And it now dives in here. And if you were carefully dissecting along here uh, from the previous view, you would have just transected the main branch of the sciatic nerve and left that animal paralyzed. Now, when we highlight it in overlay mode, it becomes pretty obvious. And I hope you can see again in white light how invisible it is. 
and how valuable it is to actually see where you're going. So this is the value of imaging in real time uh, during surgery. Uh, we hope an example of it. Uh, in a place that is actually even more clinically relevant is in prostate surgery. The cavernosal nerves are non-myelinated nerves that run right beneath the prostate under a layer of fat, and they're very difficult to see. In fact, the their anatomical course and the ability of any surgeon to avoid them was only discovered a few decades ago by someone who's still alive and has won many awards for that uh, discovery. I didn't ever think there was any part of gross anatomy that could still be discovered in the 20th century, but sure enough, there is. Uh, and uh, this is in a mouse that has far less fat than a male, human male, uh, and you cannot see the nerves, but when we turn on the nerve highlighting peptide, we can see through the fat down to the level, as long as it's not too much, we can see through some layer of fat and see the course of the nerves. And the urologists are fairly excited by the prospect that they will now be able to see what they need to avoid in order to preserve uh, erectile function, which may be not life, uh, uh, you know, essential or life-threatening, but somehow men seem to be attached to that. Uh, just to point out that we're not totally limited to cancer for uh, reasons of brevity. I have focused on cancer today, but all you have to do is change the amino acid sequence. Previously, I was showing PLGLAG. If we changed the DPRSFL, it turns out now to be a pretty selective substrate for thrombin, and we can watch thrombin activity in vivo, and here we can light up atherosclerotic plaques, which have thrombin activity, uh, as is known, uh, in the plaque. And uh, so this is a uh, view of the carotid, and in a mouse, um, the carotid is somewhat visible to the trained eye. Uh, it's harder. Um, uh, you can't see through the carotid in a human being because it's more opaque, but even with the blood coursing through it, we can see the fluorescence that marks what turns out and can be proven by subsequent histology to be aggressive thrombotic plaques, uh, mostly filling the lumen. And we think this would be helpful in surgery, at least, to uh, help the surgeon avoid accidentally bumping it, which could cause a stroke if you were operating nearby. Or if you were trying to put in a stent, it's always helpful to see exactly where it is in real time, not just by previous static CT images or occasional MR images where you get one view every 15 minutes, but to see it in real time, millisecond by millisecond, as you manipulate the tissue. And this is ever more important, I might say, as we move toward robotic surgery, because that, all that wonderful stuff that the, Dr. Pugh was showing us about the importance of touch is sort of lost, at least in current robotic surgery. That's the great downside, is that it does currently gives you no haptic feedback, so we're ever more dependent on plain old vision. So in summary, we have a mechanism for delivering cleavage-activated uh, uh, contrast agents, uh, and if there's enzymatic amplification, which was necessary to get the MRI sensitivity. Uh, the nerve homing peptide is a completely separate technology, but happens to be nicely complementary, we think. I don't want to pretend that any of these is perfect. We're trying to improve both systems, and I gave you a little hint of that, you know, one can be semi-rational and try to make these things better. We think the earliest clinical application will be an image-guided surgery precisely because we offer a little bit extra to the already trained clinician who can ignore things if we tell you that this signal is a false positive and will consistently be a false positive, you learn to ignore that. Um, early detection will be a little harder, and drug delivery will be the most challenging, though we are finally making some headway at last on that application, too, uh, which I'm well aware of is by far the one that will make me most popular amongst cancer biologists because, again, they still think that this is the only thing you want to work on. Uh, and this has taught us how important it is to work in vivo and really with clinicians to have them tell us what's important and not just ourselves as basic scientists trying to imagine what we think will be useful. So with that, I've already talked too long. I can leave this up in case there are questions uh, for what I would have as a long-term dream. We all have to have dreams even if they're unrealistic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time for maybe one question for Dr. Chen. Yes, please. That is the job of the biotech company because, again, I don't think we are qualified in, in, as a university lab to push it through the FDA. They have just started doing it. They have so far tested it 30 times the, in, in the imaging dose, and, and what it mainly does is it does turn, initially the whole mouse turns slightly bluish 
from the Psi 5, visibly through the skin. The urine is intensely aqua colored because that's the left, the normal stuff being excreted. So far, no cytotox, but there they have to go to 100 fold and they have to scale up a little more. So uh, it's looking good, but you never know. Uh, and obviously, we're at a very, very early stage. And many, many things that have looked good at this stage, we all know, didn't don't make it. We know the horrible attrition rate, and I, we may no, be no exception, so let's not get our hopes too high. Uh, we have lots of academic publications on this. Some of what I showed you is not yet published, and the company, I'm afraid, has not published anything, but that's the nature of companies. Thank you, Roger. Welcome to the uh, imaging community.